Rajendra Birbikram Sahadeep was born on 3rd December 1813 Basantapur, Nepal as the eldest son of Girvan Yuddha Bikram Saha. Rajendra Bikram Saha became king at the age 3 on the date of his father Girvan Yuddha Bikram Saha Dev in 1816. Of the two queens of Rajendra Veer Vikram Sahadev, two sons were born from the eldest Samrajya Lakshmi and two from the youngest Rajya Lakshmi Devi. As had been the case with his father, most of the Rajendra's rule was under the regency of his step grandmother Queen Lalit Tripura Sundari Devi and Prime Minister Vimsen Thapa. As regent, Vimsen Thapa kept the king Rajendra Veer Vikram Saha in isolation. King Rajendra Bir Bikram Saha did not even have the freedom to leave the palace without permission. Pemsen Thapa had instated his youngest brother Ranveer Singh Thapa in the royal palace to keep a watch on the royal family and to keep guard against any outside person. Any priest or courtier who wished to be granted an interview with the king, the queen or the regent had to get approval from Ranveer Singh and the interview had to be conducted under his watchful presence. Similarly, the royal family was not allowed to leave the palace without Vimsen Thapa's permission either. Vimsen Thapa had also neglected the formal education of King Rajendra due to which King Rajendra had grown to be uncritical and weak-minded to the extent that he was even unaware that King Rajendra was virtually a prisoner. The power balance began to change after King Rajendra came of ease and his grandmother Lalit Tripura Sundari died on 26 March 1832 due to cholera. After Lalit Tripura Sundari's death, the royal cell by which government orders were approved naturally went into the hands of senior queen Samrajya Lakshmi who wanted to establish her own regency. The King Rajendra and the Queen also started to openly challenge Bimsen Thapa's authority. By this time, Rajendra and his wife had heard the widespread rumor that Bimsen, in order to remain in power, had killed the late King Girvan Yuddha Bikram Saha and his wife by the administrating poison a few days after Girvan's coming of ease. So, when King Rajendra was afflicted by an ordinary illness, the queen cautioned the King Rajendra and prohibited him to take the medicine offered by the royal physician Sardar Ekdev Upadhyay, who was very loyal to Vimsen Thapa. This forced Vimsen Thapa to share the administrative burden between King Rajendra, Queen Samrajya Lakshmi and himself and ask for the opinion of administrative matters. King Rajendra was put in charge of defense, finance and foreign relations while Queen Samrajya Lakshmi was put in charge of justice, accountancy, and civil administration. King Rajendra appointed Vimsen Thapa to the post of Commander-in-Chief and praised Vimsen Thapa for his long service to the nation. Queen Samrajya Lakshmi was very frustrated by King Rajendra's failure to remove Vimsen Thapa from power. It is said that on 8 November 1835, Queen Samrajya caused a turmoil by leaving the Darbar at midnight, angered by King Rajendra's inability to stop Vimsen Thapa from dealing with the Governor General, with whom she felt the king should be directly dealing with. On 24th July 1837, King Rajendra's youngest son, Devendra Bikram Saha, an infant of six months, died suddenly. It was at once rumored that the child had died of poison intended for his mother, the senior queen, Samrajya Lakshmi Devi, given at the instigation of Vimsen Thapa or someone from his faction. On this charge, Vimsen Thapa, his brother Ranveer Singh Thapa, his nephew Matfur Singh Thapa, their families, the court physician Sardar Ekdev and Ek Surya Upadhyay, and his deputy Bazuman Baidya, with a few more of the nearest relatives of the Thapas, were incarcerated proclaimed outcast and their properties confiscated. The physician Ekdev and Ekshurya, being Brahmins, were severely tortured but spared, while Vazuman Baidya was impelled and killed. Under torture, Ekdev confessed and thus confirmed a widely circulated false rumor that he was directed by Vimsen Thapa to poison not just Devendra but King Girvan Yuddha Bikram Sahadev as well. 
Immediately after the incarceration of the Tapas, a new government with joint muktia was formed with Ranganath Porel as the head of civil administration. This appointed established the Pandas as the dominant faction in the court. Fearful that the Pandas would re-establish their power, Pate Jangsa, Ranganath Paurel, and the junior queen, Rajya Lakshmi Devi, obtained from the king the liberation of Bemsan Tapa, Matwar Singh, and the rest of the faction in March 1838, about eight months after they were incarcerated for poisoning case. Some of their confiscated land, as well as the Bagh Darbar, was also returned to the Tapas. Thus, Wimson Tapa went to live in retirement in Borlang Gorkha. The senior queen had been a firm supporter of the Pandes faction and the Pandes were now in full possession of power. They had gained over the king to their side by flattery. Sensing that a catastrophe was going to befall on the Tapas, Matwar Singh fled to India while pretending to go on a hunting trip. Ranbir Singh gave all of his property and became a sannyasi, tilting himself a Vyananda Puri, but Bimsen Tapa preferred to remain in his old home in Gorkha. At the beginning of 1839, Ranajang Pandey was made the sole Muktiya. Bimsen Tapa was recalled from Gorkha and the rest of his confiscated property was also released. In April 1839, the accusation of poisoning the young prince in 1837 along with two other fabricated cases was revived against Vemsen Tapa and his faction and forced paper and evidence were produced processing to increment him. The two fabricated cases were the poisoning of the King Girvan Yudda's wife and King Girvan Yudda himself who was widely known to have died of smallpox. Vemsen Tapa pleaded and asked the proof of these additional crimes for which he had been charged and asked that why these accusations were not brought when he was dismissed and imprisoned. Bemsen Tapa appealed for justice and tried to defend himself, but the king, blindly believing the forays, denounced Bemsen Tapa as a traitor and put him in house arrest in a room at the ground floor of his own Bakhtar bar. Except for Matwar Singh, who managed to escape to India, Rest of the Tapa family were again arrested, their properties confiscated, were declared outcast, and were proclaimed to be expelled from every public office for seventh generation. Bimson Tapa was given brutal treatment at the orders of Ranajang Pandey during the arrest. Ranajang Pandey did not choose direct assassination of Bimson Tapa, but some strong calculated savage measure to make sure Bimson Tapa commit suicide. One of the savage measures was that the false rumor on the method of punishment to Vimsen Tapa was circulated every day. Meanwhile, Vimsen Tapa's third wife, Bhakta Kumari, happened to insult the senior queen Samrajya Lakshmi, who, upon hearing about this insult, was so angered that she orders Bhakta Kumari to be removed from Bagh Darwar and put in a common jail. After this, a rumor started to spread around Kathmandu that Vimsen Tapa's wife, Bhakti Kumari, would be stripped of her clothes and paraded through the streets of the city. This rumor also fell on Vimsen Tapa's ear and unable to bear such indignity, Vimsen Tapa attempted suicide by slitting his throat with a knife on 20th July 1839. Somehow, did the knife get there even under surveillance till a question that need to be answered even today? Historians have suggested that Vimsen Tapa attempted suicide by cutting himself with the glasses. The news of this attempted suicide further angered the king and the queen who came to look at his body and instead of feeling sympathy for his old minister and ordering immediate medical care, Vimsen Tapa's blood-soaked, unconscious body was ordered the same day to be dragged through the streets and dumped by the same bank of Besnumati where Vimsen Tapa had dumped the dead bodies of 45 people 33 years ago during the Vandarkal massacre. Vemsen Tapa finally died nine days later, surrounded by vulture, jackals, and dogs on 5th August 1839 at the age of 64. Matwar Singh Tapa, the nephew of Vemsen Tapa, fled to Simla, India after the execution of Vemsen Tapa. Four years later, the second queen of King Rajendra Queen Rajya Lakshmi 
called Mathur Singh Thapa back and installed him as the Mukhiya, paving the way for him to eventually title himself as the first Prime Minister of Nepal. Mathur Singh Thapa's nephew, Kazi Janga Bahadur Rana, was sent to persuade his uncle Mathur Singh Thapa, after which Mathur Singh Thapa arrived in Kathmandu Valley in April 1843. Mathur Singh Thapa arrived on 17th April 1843, where a great welcome was organized for him. Mathur Singh Thapa, living in a public rest house, constantly urged that Mathur Singh Thapa would not enter Mathur Singh Thapa's residence in Kathmandu until the framed charges against Mathur Singh Thapa's family and Vimsen Thapa's family be released. In July 1843, the case was rediscussed at the council in front of King Rajendra and Queen Raja Lakshmi, where Tapa's family were declared innocent and their confiscated properties were restored. It was also declared that the poisoning case was framed by the Pandes. Matwar Singh Tapa poisoned the already insane Ranajang Pande after publicly disgracing him. In November 1843, Matwar Singh Tapa became Muktiar as well as minister and commander-in-chief of the Nepalese army. Queen Raja Lakshmi, who had ambitions of making her own son, Prince Ranendra, as the king of Nepal with Mathur Singh Thapa's help. When Mathur Singh Thapa declined the queen's request to make her own son king, the queen joined those against Mathur Singh Thapa and plotted Mathur Singh Thapa's downfall. But just to appease Mathur Singh Thapa's, he was provided with the title of Prime Minister while conspiracy to murder Mathur Singh Thapa was going on behind. Finally, when all the preparations for Mathur Singh Thapa's murders were met, he was called to the royal palace at night, informing Mathur Singh Thapa incorrectly that the queen had been ill from some kind of disease. Though Mathur Singh Thapa was warned by his own son and his mother, he went to the palace. When Matwar Singh Thapa was sleeping, Janga Bahadur was hiding under his bed. Matwar Singh Thapa was sought multiple times on his back from under the bed by Janga Bahadur Rana, where Matwar Singh Thapa immediately died. The next day, King Rajendra declared that he had himself killed Matwar Singh Thapa, accusing Matwar Singh Thapa for several activities that he had done to undermine his own power. Fateh Jung Sah was declared the Prime Minister. King Rajendra is generally described as a weak, incapable and indecisive ruler. He decided to stay out of all the ruling activities and from 1839 to 1841, his senior wife, Queen Samrajya, was the de facto regent of Nepal. Queen Samrajya died of malaria on October 6, 1941 in Hetaura while she was visiting Kasi. After the senior queen died in 1841, the junior queen, Queen Raja Lakshmi, became the de facto regent. In January 1843, Rajendra declared that he would rule the country only with the advice and agreement of his junior queen, Raja Lakshmi, and commanded his subjects to obey her even over his own son, Surendra Bikram Saha. An ambitious woman, Queen Raja Lakshmi wanted to have her son Prince Ranendra to be crowned the next king instead of her stepson Surendra. At the peak of instability in Nepalese politics, a coalition ministry was formed in September 1845. But the real power behind the throne was General Gagan Singh Bhandari, who controlled seven regiments in the army compared to the three under the Prime Minister Fateh Jung Sah. Aviman Singh Rana Magar and Zanga Bahadur Kaur also serve as commander, each with three regiments. It is occasionally alleged that General Kagan Singh Vandari had an improper relationship with Queen Raja Lakshmi Devi. Gagan Singh Bhandari was highly liked and trusted by the Queen. Gagan Singh Bhandari's notorious affair with the Queen also made him an object of jealousy and dislike to the King and the royal family. Gagan Singh Bandari was sought to date from behind while offering evening prayers at his private temple on the night of September 14, 1846. Gagan Singh Bandari's assassination remained mystery and is considered by the historians 
as one of the unsolved mystery. The Queen Raja Lakshmi Devi ordered all ministers to report themselves to the court at present day Hanuman Doka in Kathmandu. The furious Queen, as a wounded lioness, ordered out loud to bring in front of her and punish whoever might have killed General Gagan Singh Bandari. She commanded Aviman Singh, the then commander in chief of Nepali army, to assemble the entire military and administrative establishment of Kathmandu immediately at the courtyard of the palace armory. Following the Queen's order, courtiers hurried to the court as soon as they heard the royal summons. Many of the courtiers went unarmed except for a sword as they had responded immediately to the royal summons. The only leader with organized body of the troops in the court area was Janga Bahadur. Janga Bahadur came with his seven brothers and their regiments. At almost midnight, most of the courtiers were present at court. Everyone there was full of fear and skeptical thoughts. Queen Raja Lakshmi was standing in the court with a drawn sword in her hand. She was striking at the gathered courtiers incoherently and asking for the name of the murderer of her paramour. The queen summarily wanted to behead Pandey with her own raised sword, but Patejang Jung and Janga Bahadur held her back. General Aviman Singh Maga spoke to the king about the possibility of a massacre. Emotions ran high among the assembled bands of nobles and their followers who listened to the queen give an emotional harangue blaming the Pandes and demanding that Aviman Singh Rana Magar to execute Kazi Birkesar Pandey, whom the queen suspected for the death of Gagan Singh. Aviman Singh hesitated and looked to the king. The king, Rajendra, hesitated and said to punish the guilty only after a proper investigation of the matter. King Rajendra pointed out that he must have a discussion with Prime Minister Fateh Jangsa regarding this matter and left. King Rajendra then left Hanuman Dhoka Palace and went to British residency. When King Rajendra was denied an audience with the resident at such a late hour, King Rajendra went to Naranhiti Palace. In Naranhiti, King Rajendra had some alone with Prime Minister Fateh Jangsa. Either King Rajendra had not wanted to give information about the condition at court or Prime Minister Fateh Jung had not understood the point. In either cases, Prime Minister Fateh Jung went to the court with simple security. Meanwhile, at court, surrounded by Janga Bahadur Regiment, tension grew high as most of the nobles and Prime Minister Fateh Jung Sa gathered there. Seeing a high possibility of bloodshed, Janga Bahadur, Fateh Jung, and Aviman Singh Rana decided that Janga Bahadur and Fateh Jung should try to calm the Queen and Aviman Singh Rana Magar, who had disobeyed the Queen's order, would stay behind. As the two went to find Queen, Aviman Singh decided to move his own regiment to the court. But Aviman Singh was prevented from leaving. Aviman Singh tried to force his way out and was killed in the process. The dying Aviman Singh Rana Magar wrote a letter in Nepali, Ja, on the court wall, with the blood gossing out his chest, suggesting the Janga Bahadur Rana being the culprit. After panic ensued, the bloodshed began. Many Thapas, Pandit, and Basnet died, including Fateh Jung, Karak Bikram Sah, and Dalvanjan Pandey. Some escaped by climbing over walls and roofs and even through the drainage system. Janga Bahadur easily used the situation to eliminate his rivals. The Pandey and Thapa families in particular were devastated during the slaughter. It has always seemed suspicious that the king was notably absent when the fighting began and that Janga Bahadur was the only leader who was ready for the trouble and with all the weapons. The extent of the carnage was apparently unexpected. Janga Bahadur was the only one true beneficiary of the massacre and became the only military leader in the position of strength in the capital. The next day, Janga Bahadur became Prime Minister and immediately launched a purse that killed many of his aristocratic competitors and drove 6,000 people into exile in India. Janga Bahadur came to power through the 1846 court massacre where 36 members of the palace court, including the Prime Minister and a relative of the King, Chauterya Fateh Jangsa, were murdered. 
by 1850, Jung Bahadur eliminated all of his major rivals, installed his own candidate on the throne, appointed his brother and cronies in all the important spots, and ensured that the major administrative decisions were made by him as Prime Minister. The Queen commanded Janga Bahadur to remove Prince Surendra from the rank and declare her own son Ranendra as the new prince but Janga Bahadur ignored it which resulted in the Queen holding a vendetta against them. A few people had survived the court massacre who were secretly planning to take revenge upon Janga Bahadur. The Queen secretly contacted them and conspired to assassinate Janga Bahadur. A plan was formed to do so in a gathering to be organized in the Garden of Bandar Khal, situated at the eastern end of the palace, but the plot was revealed to Janga Bahadur. Janga Bahadur accused the queen of actually plotting to kill the then crown Prince Surendra and his younger brother Prince Upendra so that her own son Prince Ranendra would become the next king. Queen Raja Lakshmi and her two sons were exiled, and King Rajendra accompanied them for a pilgrimage in Banarasi. In King Rajendra's absence, Crown Prince Surendra was made the Prince Regent. From exile, Rajendra sought to regain power by creating and mobilizing an army. But Janga Bahadur learned of Rajendra's plan and attacked his camp in Alau. King Rajendra was captured while trying to flee and forced him to abdicate the throne in favor of his son Surendra. Janga Bahadur's force captured Rajendra in 1847 and brought Rajendra to Bhaktapur and later he was permitted to stay in Hanuman Dhoka Palace. Janga Bahadur arranged it so that nobody could meet the ex-King Rajendra without his permission. He had made sure that Rajendra's second son, Prince Upendra, could not visit Rajendra without the consent of the minister. King Surendra had to visit his father once every month. However, Janga Bahadur made sure that the ex-King Rajendra could not be consulted by any foreign and domestic affair and he was not permitted to leave the Darwar without the consent of the king. For the rest of his life, Rajendra lived under house arrest. While Surendra remained the king, he had little power. Janga Bahadur Rana ruled the country. Rajendra Bir Bikram Sahadev died in Bhaktapur Darbar on 10th July 1881 at the age of 67. The kings were kept away from the affairs of the state while the Rana Prime Minister had real authority in every sector of the society. Thank you.